Bonjour all you gardening cats and gators. Welcome to a special edition of Gardening with Cisco. I'm here on the beautiful Seattle U campus where I actually directed the gardening for 24 years. During my time here, I learned a great appreciation for the importance of green space in the big city. So what better place is there to talk about urban gardening? The city of Seattle is in the middle of a population boom. Seems like there are tower cranes and huge skyscrapers popping up everywhere you look. With all that construction, it might feel like we're squeezing out the green space. And that just doesn't work for the Emerald City. The good news is Seattle knows the benefits of Mother Nature and has taken steps to make sure she always has a home here. Seattle's commitment to green space is nothing new. It actually started way back in 1973 when the city put in the first pea patches. A pea patch is the city of Seattle's version of a community garden. It's people coming together to do things in their neighborhood around food. I'm Rich McDonald and I'm the supervisor of the Seattle Pea Patch Community Gardening Program. The city has 90 separate gardens that we manage, and there's a total of 3,000 families that are, are active in this program. Uh, this park and pea patch, it's an homage to Paul Hodeyuchi, and Paul Hodeyuchi was a famous Seattle artist, and in this garden, we have people that are from the First Hill neighborhood, Seattle University, and Yesler Terrace, which is right across the street. So we've got nine different languages in this, in this community. Everybody here in this garden is so diverse and it's just great to live in a neighborhood where we can, even though we don't speak the same languages, I, I smile to them and we try to talk and it's just good. Growing up, I always had gardens and when we moved here, there's just no place for apartment dwellers to garden and I needed to get my feet dirty. <laughs> I'm really happy to be a part of the Peak Park program at um, this park. We are from Burma, also known as Myanmar. In our country, we grow vegetables as part of our daily life. And sometimes when I'm kind of stressed, I come here to look around and I feel at ease and kind of relaxed. Getting out and getting in the dirt, it's, it's nice to have a little bit of nature in the city. We grow tomatoes right now and it cuts down on our groceries because we can grow our own food. I swear when you grow your own food, it tastes better. It just tastes better when you've grown it with your own hands. One of the great things about pea patches is they activate space. They bring people in. Coming to work parties and sharing the food with people, even if you can't speak with them, um, they'll tell you about their food, they'll show you your vegetables. I mean, that's really the greatest part about a community garden. Do you ever wonder why we call them pea patches? They were named after the first local family that started a community garden in Seattle, the Picardo family. So it's P for Picardo. So you don't need a big plot of land to grow veggies. You could do it just as well in a container, even Brussels sprouts. And I know a great place to learn all about it. So I'm here with Carrie from Seattle Tilth. We're at Bradner Gardens Park in Seattle, and we're gonna talk about container gardening. So, you know, I know that people live uh, in an apartment with a small deck or a condominium. They probably don't have a lot of choice, but are there a lot of advantages to doing container gardening? Sure, absolutely. Even if you um, have opportunity to have an in-ground garden, containers are really nice to um, add some visual interest to your garden. You know what I like too is that you don't have to bend over so far to work it. <laughs> You're not on your hands and knees all the time. Absolutely, you can bring it up, you can have it on a table like we have. Are there any restrictions about the kind of pots you should use for container gardening like this? For me, you know, wood is a nice choice. There are lots of different kinds of nursery plastics out there that people use and ceramic. Um, if you can choose a container that's food safe um, when you're growing food, that's gonna be smart. That makes sense. I've actually read that some clay pots, the clay may have come from polluted areas. I, I have heard that too. Maybe I heard it from you. That could be. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are we planting in this guy? 
Well, we've got um, a really great option for container gardens and a good place to get started is a salad garden. I think the most bang for your buck, if you have just a small amount of space to grow in, salad greens and herbs are gonna show up in your kitchen. Oh, cool as can be. Yeah, let's plant some things in here. Okay, so we've got that corn salad there. I like to, if you think about the container as this being the sunny side or the front, I like to put the taller things in the back. So um, this is a, um, it's called perpetual spinach, but actually is a chard. Oh, and okay, like, so that'll grow a little taller. It'll grow a little bit taller. And I find that sometimes it can be challenging to grow spinach, and chard is much easier to grow. So now, do you always break the root ball a little? I do. I like to um, do that, especially if you see that the roots are starting to follow the shape of that pot. Right. There we go. And the nice thing, like on the uh, mash here, is we can just pull off individual leaves, right? We don't have to harvest the whole thing at one shot. You got it. You got it. A lot of these salad greens you can harvest. They kind of grow from the center and come out, and you can harvest the outside leaves and then just leave the plant to keep growing and give you more leaves. Yeah. Um, I like to always water uh, whenever yeah. I transplant. Sun's starting to come out, so maybe we want to make sure those guys get a little bit of water. In container gardens, you can grow, you know, pretty much anything that you would grow in the ground garden. You just want to make sure that you have a large enough or a appropriate size container. So probably wouldn't want to do a pumpkin in here, right? Not in this one for sure. <laughs> if you had, you know, if you had a bigger whiskey barrel, it might it might happen. I but I can see that. Yeah. Uh, there's some resources you recommend that are really good for uh, gardeners that want to grow in containers or in the ground for that matter. Yeah. Well, this um, the Maritime Northwest Garden Guide, which is published by Seattle Tilth. Is is really great, especially for um, figuring out the timing of when to be planting these things. In our climate, which we call maritime climate, uh, you can be planting food nine months out of the year. Isn't that amazing? It's really amazing. And uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that you can do uh, beautiful herbs and, and spectacular perennial plants all together. So you don't have to just do veggies. We could do, uh, you know, annuals or all kinds mm -hmm. of spectacular plants in here, huh? Yeah, so. and some edible ornamentals. Like you could pop a few violas, some pansies in there. We got red, ruby red chard. So, so it could ornamentals, be spectacular. Edimentals. Have your beautiful garden, eat it too. You How do you it. beat that? You got it. When we come back, harvest in black gold. And later on, I'll show you what all the buzz is about. Bees! Okay, I'm back with Carrie from Seattle Tilt. We're here at Bradner Garden, and we're where the action is, at the compost bin. Yeah, so this um, part of this park is a pea patch, a good portion of it, and the um, pea patch gardeners volunteer to be on the compost committee, and they um, build a hot compost pile once a month through the growing season. Sometimes people are confused how to do compost. So yeah. first of all, do you need a certain size bin? Well, there are a lot of different ways to do compost. And so there's, this is the most um, high maintenance way to do compost. Oh, yes. Yeah, we have a three bin system here. We build a very large pile. This is a cubic yard. Um, ah, and that's okay. what we call it hot compost because it actually heats up. But people can make compost in their backyard just by um, cold composting or like passive composting. Um, and it will break down. Okay, I'm getting the idea how to make this stuff, but why is compost so important? So compost, um, what it is, is it's broken down organic matter and it acts um, in the soil like a sponge. As a sponge, it will absorb water and help to drain off. And it does the same where it holds on to nutrients, actually releases nutrients as the microbes break it down in the soil. And when you feed them this organic matter and help to break it down, they're gonna release those nutrients to your plants. So when it's all broken down, will it smell bad or? It shouldn't, it should smell. And this actually, if you wanna give it, you wanna give it a whiff? Sure. It should just smell like soil. Mm, it smells earthy. Yeah. Hey, so I felt heat when I put my hand in there. Is this warming up the way you want it to? I think so. I've got a compost thermometer here. Oh, Would you like to? Oh boy, yeah, I want to see. It's got a really long stem so we can get into the middle of the pile. Ooh, that went up fast. Well, for this hot compost pile, we're looking at temperatures of above 130. We looked in the thermometer, but we can, if we go down. Oh my gosh, it's smoking in there. Yeah, you see that steam coming out? Wow. 
Oh, so that's just what you want, huh? That's what we're looking for here with this um, compost pile. You know, I hear so many gardeners call this black gold. They, people really get good at making their own compost, don't they? It's like they just love what they create. It's true, and I, you know, I've joked about um, wrapping it up in little cellophane bags and giving it to your gardening friends as Christmas gifts. So it's a bit of work, but mm -hmm. really something great. Absolutely, absolutely. Great, well. So uh, speaking of work. I gotta turn all this? There you go. Oh my gosh, no rest for the weary. This is gonna take forever. Whew, that was a lot of work. And that was only a cubic yard of compost. Seattle U makes a hundred times more and it all goes back to care for the campus. Speaking of urban gardening on a grander scale, I'm curious how Seattle plans to add green space as more people move into the city. So I'm gonna head across the street to a new park to talk with Michael Shiosaki from the Seattle Parks and Rec Department. Okay, Michael, I gotta tell you a big surprise. This spot right here where the park is was my ground shop when I directed grounds care at Seattle University. You know, we may have to add a commemorative plaque or something here. <laughs> oh, I'd like that, to say the least. Well, tell us about this new park. So 12th Avenue Square Park is really kind of a new prototype for parks in Seattle. They're in urban centers in the city. Um, they include art and um, they're activated by neighborhood businesses, coffee shops, restaurants. They also have ecological functions like stormwater swales. So it's really kind of a new prototype for our city. How important is green space? Uh in cities these days? Well, you know, as I think more and more people live in apartments or condominiums and don't have kind of their own green space, it's just more important to have places like this to recreate, to come out and just breathe the fresh air and be amongst the, the plants. And so I think it, these spaces just become more and more important in our city. So do you have any idea how many people are expected to move into Seattle over the next few years? It, it's estimated that about 120,000 more people will move to the city in the next 20 years. So it's really wow. significant. I noticed this park seems to uh, meander into the neighborhood a little bit. It does, it also includes the uh, James Court street right of way. And so we've redesigned that into what's called a Vunerf, which is a Dutch a, a word. A Vunerf? A Vunerf, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Dutch word and it means a space where you combine pedestrians and bicycles and cars all in one. And really there's the priority for bicycles and pedestrians over cars. Alongside that is a stormwater swale that accepts stormwater off of this site and then cleanses it before it goes underground. So it's really a whole combination of things you, that are happening in this park. So I've noticed there's a lot of interesting features in this park and uh, so what's this blue thing here? So um, this is known as kind of the big blue pillow and you can, um, you can lay down on it and look up at the sculpture, Ellen Sollett's sculpture above. Um, or you can just stand here and jump. <laughs> oh man, I am leaping. <laughs> well, hey Michael, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I'm so happy to live in a city where uh, people really care about making sure we have green space, improving the environment and making it beautiful. So uh, keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Okay, I gotta lie down. I wanna look at this sculpture. Yahoo! Up next, rain gardens. How you can turn your yard into a pollution fighting machine. I'm back on the Seattle U campus in front of the Lemure Library, home to this beautiful rain garden. But what exactly is a rain garden? I'd better talk to an expert. So I'm here with Aaron Clark from Stewardship Partners, and if you want to know about rain gardens, this is the guy to talk to. <laughs> you got it. Hey, so uh, tell us, what is a rain garden? Well, the basic is it's a bowl-shaped garden. It's got really spongy soils, 
plants that love to get their feet wet, and then we direct stormwater runoff into it so that that water can soak back in just like it would in a forest, um, so it's not running off of our roads and our roofs and our parking lots. So is that a big problem that we're getting too much runoff now? It is, actually. The, the runoff coming into Puget Sound is the single largest source of pollution. I like to say water is the friendly molecule. If you look at the oxygen and the hydrogens, it's walking around like this, like it's ready for a hug, right? It picks up everything as it goes, um, and as it does, not everything it picks up is great. It's dog poop, it's brake dust, it's car tire rubber, um, it's all those things. And if it goes into the storm drain at the edge of the curb, that pipe is connected either straight into the lake or Puget Sound, and it doesn't really go through any kind of treatment. So that water that started as rain just a few minutes ago suddenly becomes this huge source of, of pollution, and a rain garden transforms it. I got to tell you, if I were a homeowner, you know, and I'm looking to put in a rain garden, I wouldn't really know where to start. Yeah. No, I, I know exactly what you mean. I was there not long ago. Um, and that's actually another great thing about where we are is that we have amazing scientists, amazing research teams that have figured all that stuff out and they've put it all into one packet, basically. The Western Washington Rain Garden Handbook is available on the 12,000 Rain Gardens. I've seen website. it. It's great. <laughs> What's it going to cost me? Is this going to cost me an arm and a leg? Well, there is no simple way to answer that question because it runs the gamut. It depends. You could probably do it um, yourself for anywhere from 200 to $500 just for the plants, soils, um, and a few ibuprofen for your back. <laughs> um, but if you want to have a landscape professional come in and do it, it ranges anywhere from 3000 5000 10000 depending on just how fancy you want it, how big you want it. Uh, is there any government program or anything that will help with a cost? Yeah, so a lot of cities have started to invest in rain gardens. There's programs like the RainWise program that City of Seattle and King County run jointly together. And we've tried to compile them all on 12,000raingardens.org. So Aaron, you've convinced me that rain gardens are great for the environment, but are there any other benefits you can think of? There are so many benefits, it's hard to, to quantify them. But, you know, for me, at the end of the day, it's a personal aesthetic benefit. It's a beautiful space for me. On the bigger scale, you know, uh, there's amazing research coming out now that shows human health, mental health benefits, reduce stress from just having more nature in our cities and in our communities and in our neighborhoods. Wow, oh, well, I'll tell you what, it's really neat to talk to you because People are learning how to put in a beautiful garden that helps our environment. How do you do better than that? It, it's a feel-good thing. Yeah we love doing it. Nice work. Thanks, Cisco. All right. When we come back, I'm going in. Hey, Jeff. How's it going? Good. Hi, nice, Cisco. So I'm here with Jeff Steenbergen, and uh, you're from the Puget Sound Beekeepers Association, and uh, you are the expert at raising bees. Yeah. Hey, so uh, why are bees so important? I know they're having problems these days. Yeah, well, bees are really important. About two thirds of our food is pollinated by bees. So we need a lot of bees lot if of we bees want a for, big for pear crops. Yeah. Oh la la. So are the bees in as much trouble as we're hearing these days? They are in trouble. Um, I, you know, there is the, a little bit of media hype, um, but uh, we are losing about 30% of our colonies or more every year. Here you are raising bees in the Washington Park Arboretum where there's a lot of people around. Is that is it kind of dangerous to have bees near people? Uh, no, actually, uh, bees aren't out to get you. They're there for food. They want to get food to take back to the hive. They're not there to randomly attack people. Uh, the times when you might get stung is if you're in the garden and you're pulling weeds and you, you, there's a bee in the, one of the little flowers there and you, you, you squish it. Uh, she's yeah. going to sting you because she's getting squished. And, well, yeah. there is one other way because it happened to me. I sat on one and it was a very uplifting experience. <laughs> oh, la, la. <laughs> okay, Jeff, I want to see those bees close up. Is that possible? Yeah, it is. Uh, let's get you suited up and we'll take a look. There we go. I look rather fashionable if I do say so myself. 
All right, so first thing we'll do is we'll get the, the, the smoker lit. It masks the pheromone that they release so that they're a little calmer when we go in there. All right, so now that we've got a good smoke going, let's, uh, let's open up the hive. Oh man, this is gonna be exciting. Holy cripes, look at them all on there. Yeah, these bees are pretty calm. I mean, I wasn't sure what to expect. I thought there'd be like, a, you know, 50,000 of them flying around us, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, they're, uh, they're, hard, they're such hard workers that they're just focused on working. And the fact that we're in here disturbing them is the least of their concern right now. Do you think we might see the queen? We're gonna look for her. She might, I think she's gonna be down here. So what I'm looking for is signs that she's here, no. which would be eggs or larvae. Oh, okay. There she is. Where is she? So there, the queen is right here. Oh, that's the queen. Oh, that There's is exciting. Queen. Yeah, she looks different. I can't believe you managed to find her in this all these boxes somehow. I've had so much fun learning about gardening in the big city, and there's no better place to do it than on the beautiful Seattle U campus. They even named this garden after me. Oh la la! Just goes to show, no matter where you live, no matter how much space you have, there's always room for mother nature. So what are you waiting for? Get out there and garden. <laughs> <laughs>